Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Eitan Stern. I'm the Managing Director of Legalese. Um, I'm going to be your host for today, and I've got two really amazing speakers, which I'll introduce in a minute. Um, just a little bit about us and Legalese. We are a legal practice that caters specifically for the tech and creative industry. So we've got a host of legal services that we do, ranging from commercial work, IP protection, labor, um, and regulation services, which is uh, dealing into kind of certain regulated areas. Basically, we do work for businesses um, in the startup and creative industry. And what we're on a mission to do is change the way that lawyers work. Um, we're building law firm in the future. So taking all the experiences that people have had with uh, dealing with lawyers and trying to make them better, nicer, and easier to deal with. Um, and we've got a few ways to deal to do to do that, but that's a conversation for another time. So just to introduce the topic for today. Um, so today we're going to be talking about business valuations. Why are businesses valuations uh, uh, necessary? Well, if you are, you know, kind of a modern tech company in the modern age of modern tech companies, there's uh, a lot of the industry is built on raising investments um, or building a company to exit it. And part of that is understanding the value of the company and what it's worth. Now, valuation is actually a complex thing, specifically for tech companies and startups, because the traditional way to value companies would say would be to say, cool, this company's got a certain amount of assets or makes a certain amount of money, and we're going to base the valuation around that. The problem is today, a lot of very valuable companies have had no revenue or a very early stage. Very good, big example would be um, would be Uber. Uber when when public. At, at many tens of millions of dollars, uh, uh, at a many tens of millions of dollar valuation, they had never turned a profit. So the, the idea of valuing companies has sort of changed over the years. And it's really important for us to be able to have tools to be able to value companies. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, specifically how one values companies, which are small to medium sized companies, and how we prepare our companies for for exit as well. So what are the things besides valuation that you as a founder or a business owner might be and uh, might need to think about when preparing your company for an exit or for investment? So that's the kind of broad topic of today. Uh, I've got two fantastic speakers. Um, the second speaker who I'll introduce in a, in a bit is Graham Stephen. He's from a company called Bizval. And Bizval is a company which has figured out a really, really nifty tool, uh, well, which has built a really nifty tool for companies to be able to do valuations of small to medium sized businesses online. They've got a couple of really interesting services, which I won't go through now. I'll leave it for Graham to talk about later. But first, before Graham speaks, I want to introduce Carl Freitag. Carl is the head of commercial law at Legalese. So he's on our team, an unbelievably smart lawyer with, a, with, uh, with many years of experience doing commercial and contract work. Carl is a master of drafting contracts and has worked with, with hundreds of companies at many stages of their businesses. So um, he's, he's got some extensive experience in litigation, but over the last couple of years with Legalese, he's been focused on helping companies build themselves up for scale. So that's putting contracts in place, that's assisting with mergers and acquisitions, that's from time to time assisting them through disputes. But largely it's working with corporate and commercial work for companies and helping them scale. Um, I'm going to hand over to Carl, who's going to be talking about some aspects that a company would need to think about when preparing themselves for investment. I'm not going to spoil too much of Carl's talk, so I'll let him get into it. Um, but enjoy. And uh, after Carl, will be Graham, and then we'll open up for some questions before we wrap up. All right. Thanks very much for the kind introduction, Eitan. Um, and welcome, everybody, to our monthly So Now You Know webinar where we discuss an interesting legal topic in a bit more detail so all you fine people out there can benefit. Uh, today, our topic relates to preparing your company for investment or otherwise preparing for an exit. Uh, before we get there though, um, a little bit about legalese. Uh, you know, I, might, I might repeat some, some of the things that Eitan has said, but just bear with me for two seconds. Um, legalese, as we said, is a creative legal practice which has redesigned legal services to suit creative startup and tech-based businesses by making them accessible, affordable, and understandable. Traditionally, lawyers are called upon to fix problems, but at Legalese, we look at law differently. We have a fresh approach to law and technology, so our legal solutions fit your business, team, and culture, as opposed to your business, team, and culture fitting in with our legal solutions. Um, all right, so a bit more about me. Um, 
like Eitan said, I'm the head of commercial law at Legalese. I'm also the head of our gaming law department. Uh, I assist our clients with all their legal needs from drafting contracts, advising on an internal structuring and everything but in between. Uh, at Legalese, we try to be a little bit of a one-stop shop for uh, one-stop legal shop for our clients. Um, so I fill, fill the role of, uh, of doing all the, all the commercial legal aspects for our clients and, uh, and assisting our gaming uh, clients with their needs as well. All right, so what are we talking about today? Uh, today, uh, we'll generally be talking about some of the legal considerations that you need to take into account when preparing your company for an exit or otherwise taking on investment. Naturally, this process has many different aspects to it that we'll work our way through during this presentation. But as a general point, the more prepared you are to receive investment, the more attractive you are for potential investment. A potential investor will never want to put their money into, into a messy situation. So firstly, let's discuss due diligence. Firstly, what is due diligence? Uh, due diligence is a process undertaken by potential buyers or investors to ensure that your company is as viable under the hood as your marketing or sales rhetoric says that it is. Most buyers and investors have different approaches to due diligence relating to what they consider to be the most important factors, which can make it a little bit more difficult to prepare for due diligence because you don't know what factors are specifically important to those, to those, uh, to those investors. In general, it's a good idea to ensure that your financial and legal records and documentation are kept up to date and that the latest available versions are ready to be presented at a moment's notice. At a minimum, you should have documents like your latest financial statements, your latest annual general meeting uh, minutes, copies of your annual budget, your balance sheet, your profit and loss statement, and your cash flow statements, um, as well as your cap table. Uh, all, the, all these documents should be made available for the perusal and consideration by your potential buyer or investor. Um, and so basically what a potential buyer or investor is trying to see is whether your business is a safe place to put their money. So they need to have sight of the various financial, legal, operational and compliance aspects involved in that. So in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna go through a few things to take into account in that regard, mainly from a legal perspective. Uh, so now that we've dealt with due diligence, let's dive into some of these important factors. Um, the first one being your contractual obligations. So when it comes to your contractual obligations, it's obviously a crucial first step to ascertain what obligations you actually have. Uh, in this regard, it's important to review your existing contractual agreements or otherwise have them reviewed by a legal person uh, to assess the obligations that you have and whether they'll be impacted by your planned exit or, or investment events. Often supplier agreements and other simple, similar contracts will have a stipulation that the other party has certain rights in relation to what lawyers call a change of control. Briefly, a change of control can take many forms, but suffice it to say that in this particular context, it means that sufficient shares in your company or sufficient membership interest in your, in your CC uh, that will allow the selling party to control what's happening in the company or CC are changing hands. This often give, gives rise to a contracting party being given a right of first option or otherwise a right to terminate the contract if their prior written consent is not obtained before the tra transaction occurs. This can easily land you in hot water with a major client or supplier if you, if you, don't, or if you aren't aware of or forget about or, or simply ignore uh, these change of control provisions that might be in one of your contracts. It's clear therefore that there is a need to address potential issues arising from contracts before entering into the purchase or investment transaction. Change of control is only one such consideration. So it's a great idea to have somebody with some legal knowledge, take a look at all your agreements and give you appropriate advice. Um, so moving on, while we've discussed the external facing contracts in the previous slide, it's also important to consider internal legal agreements. For example, your shareholders agreement. Um, they, a shareholders agreement might contain preemptive rights clauses or drag along and tag along clauses, which might very well impact on, on how you do things or how you are legally allowed to do things. Another important document is your company's memorandum of incorporation, uh, or, or you, you know, depending on the entity, whatever your, your sort of constitutional documentation for the company might be, which could also very well contain relevant provisions in that regard. 
Um, next is ensuring that your intellectual property rights are properly defined and protected. This is always relevant, but it's particularly important in two circumstances. Firstly, where the product that you sell is your intellectual property, like tech companies, for example, who grant their client licenses to use their software or platform. Um, or secondly, where you provide services such that you create intellectual property for other parties. It's very important to understand what your IP is and then to protect it appropriately from there. So how do we do that? Well, it's uh, through, through proper contractual documentation and building a proper contractual relationships with your clients or suppliers. Um, and for, for certain types of intellectual property, for example, uh, trademarks or patents, uh, you need to have those rights registered with the appropriate uh, entity. If you're worried about these kind of things, uh, please get in touch with us at Legalese and we'll be able to get you sorted. Lastly, in relation to intellectual property rights, it is important to address disputes around infringements of your intellectual property or where you might have accidentally infringed a third party's IP. So we'll talk about it a little bit more in a later slide, but with disputes and litigation are a big red flag for investors. So it's very important to get these things sewn up before the due diligence process begins. Right, let's talk a little bit about regulation, uh, regulatory compliance. So it's obviously important to comply with South African laws and regulations. There may very well be regulations that apply to specifically to your industry or licenses that your business needs to obtain in order to operate lawfully. It's very likely that your investor's lawyer will want copies of the requisite registrations and licenses. And if they aren't in place, it could end your chances of, rece uh, of receiving an investment right there, uh, or at the very least substantially delay the process while you get those things in place. So extremely important to ensure that you are compliant with regulation and legislation. Um, tax considerations. Tax considerations are also naturally very important. Uh, you need to get, you'll, you'll need to get in touch with a tax expert who can take you through the process of assessing uh, the specific proposed structure of your exit or investment, and then provide you with the requisite advice on whether that structure is the most efficient for your purposes. Bear in mind here that the investor might want to structure your, your, in the, his investment in a certain way, um, and that might conflict with the most efficient structure for you personally. Uh, in those circumstances, you need to balance the impact that the investor structure will have on your tax liability versus the benefit that you'll actually receive at the end of the day from that investment or that your company will receive from that investment. The, the expert that you engage in that regard will help you to do that, which is why it's so important to obtain professional advice uh, in, in relation to tax considerations. Let's then discuss employee matters, which is also, uh, also a, a crucial consideration to take into account. Um, the impact that your uh, that your investment might have on your employees, employees cannot be overstated. Um, ensure that your side of things is squeaky clean by complying with applicable labor law, especially if there are things like retrenchments or transfers of employment that are involved. There are codes of good practice to comply with and labor law is ever changing. So get the guidance of a lawyer to assist you in avoiding potential common mistakes of which there are many. This is again a red flag that is raised for your investors, especially where you have an aggrieved employee dragging you to the CCMA for an unfair dismissal or for not following some other relevant appropriate procedure. Next, I want to address confidentiality and non-disclosure. Ideally, you want to maintain confidentiality during negotiations around investment or exit. This doesn't only pertain to the subject matter of the negotiations, but can also pertain to the fact that the negotiations are actually occurring or to the negotiations themselves. You can use non-disclosure agreements or commonly referred to as NDAs to protect sensitive information. And this is also particularly relevant where you are sharing with the investor how you do what you do or you're sharing source code in software, for example. You don't want to show how your bread is made before you, uh, while you're trying to sell the bakery, if that analogy makes sense. All right, so um, with regard to competition law, certain transactions that might occur may trigger the provisions of the Competition Act. Um, and it's important to obtain legal advice and address any competition law concerns before they become an issue. For example, 
you might need to report certain qualifying transactions to the Competition Commission, and that process must be appropriately managed by a lawyer because you don't want to make disclosures or anything like that that may prejudice you going forward, but you do need to play open cards with the Competition Commission as well. Um, so litigation and disputes. As I mentioned earlier, there's nothing that kills an investment quite like ongoing litigation or an ongoing dispute. It's important to try to resolve these before embarking on the process because an investor will not want to become embroiled in expensive and potentially protracted dispute resolution processes. Um, of course, I'm not saying here that you should roll over and capitulate if you have a, a good faith belief that the, split, that the litigation that you've been involved in is of a spurious nature or somebody's trying to, to get one over on you. Um, I'm just saying that it's best to avoid these complications and to clear the legal landscape so that your exit is easy and unimpeded. So disclosure and transparency. This basically means don't lie to a potential investor. It's crucial to play open cards with an investor and to provide accurate, complete information that will allow an investor to make an informed decision about whether to invest in your company. Inadequate or fraudulent disclosure can lead to an investor saying that you made what lawyers call, uh, what lawyers call a fraudulent misrepresentation, inducing them to enter into a contract, which is just a fancy way of saying you lied, they trusted you, and, they, and off the basis of that trust, they entered into a contract with you. This can lead to legal issues, which can involve you having to pay back all of the investor's money, uh, as well as damages that the investor might have incurred for professional fees, for example, or other costs that they might have incurred um, in, in, in uh, entering into this contract with you. So be very, very careful around that. Um, lastly, it's, uh, consult legal experts. Don't go it alone. Um, investments and exits are a potential legal minefield if you don't know what you're doing. You can be the smartest person in your entire industry, but unless you have the appropriate legal or accounting experience, it's highly likely that you'll miss something in this process. So work with your lawyer, work with your accountant. Their fees uh, will be worth it in the long run um, because they'll help, help you to tailor your approach to your, to your business's unique circumstances and assist you in minimizing your legal risks. This will also ensure that your exit or investment process is a smooth and successful one. At Legalese, for example, we have a product called a legal gap analysis where we take you through all aspects of your business to establish if, uh, uh, if there are any legal gaps that you don't or any legal aspects that you don't have in place. And we assist you in closing those gaps in a little bit more of a manageable, sustainable fashion. So. Today, we discussed the legal aspects that are relevant to you if you're considering an investment or an exit. We covered a range of topics from due diligence to the importance of engaging appropriate exit, uh, experts to assist you. Uh, so before I go, I just want to encourage everybody to please let us know if you have any further questions or comments or concerns in relation to the discussion today. Um, here are our, our contact details. Um, or you can also get in touch with us via our website, www.legalese.co.za, or by emailing info at legalese.co.za. Um, I'm going to hand, over, uh, hand you guys back to my colleague, Eitan, who's going to introduce the next speaker. But thank you very, very much for your time and kind attention. Thanks, Carl. Really interesting. Nice to see a lot of that, uh, that stuff summarize and put down into into a presentation so thanks a lot i'm sure everyone got good value from that um to introduce the next speaker is graham stevens from bisval graham is, so bisval is a really interesting company that we've just started working with um we actually did the valuation for our for our company a couple of weeks ago it's really cool to see the product in action and um, graham has a an extensive history 10 years in in the banking uh and finance sector and then another 10 years working for for uh, startups and in, in different capacities which i'm sure Graham can tell us more about but there's some big names on there he's worked in standard bank he's worked in jumo he's worked in uh, tech stars amongst others um and now graham has founded uh, bizval which is this platform in order to do small business uh, small to medium business valuations really simply and easily um i know personally this is a challenge we've seen for our clients many times over the years that you want a valuation but if you go to an accountant or a, 
the chartered accountant to do evaluation, it's cost it might cost you more than or as much as, as the, the price of what you're trying to sell the company for. Um and BizWealth created a solution for us. I'm gonna hand over to Graham, tell us a little bit more, more about valuations and about his work. Thanks, Graham. Great, thanks, Aitan and the Legalist team. And thank you for hosting us here on the webinar today. So just need to get my admin sorted out here. And you should be able to see the screen. There we go. So first of all, I think we want to just give a bit of a background as to what is Bizwell and why did we start Bizwell? So Aitan. We gave a bit of the context behind it, but I, a few years ago, started a consulting firm where we worked as sort of the right-hand man to business owners, helping them grow, scale, raise money for their businesses. And one of the biggest frustrations we found was that business owners weren't always clear or sure what did they want to do with their business. So did they want to be self-employed? Did they want to exit? Were they thinking about retirement? So that was the first question we came across. And invariably, the second question was, well, what do you want to do? You know, so what is your company worth? If you want to retire, is your company worth enough so that you can retire? And is it sellable? And Biswell was developed as a response to that. As Aiden rightly said, you know, you know, we would send customers off to get a valuation done and they'd come back with a quote for two, 250,000 Rand to value their company. And they'd say, well, I'd love to know what it's worth, but I'm not prepared to spend that. So that's where Biswell originated. It was to help small business owners, entrepreneurs make better decisions around scaling, raising money, or exiting their businesses. And we wanted to change the way that, that, that was done. We wanted to talk directly to the entrepreneur and not to talk in language that sounded like an accountant. So, you know, we, we entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. So the first thing to realize is whether you want to sell a business or raise money for a business, is a business is not a white Toyota. So I'm not going to talk verbatim through these points. But in essence, selling a business is a little bit more complicated. Selling a business is a bit more akin to selling an old classic car. You know, it, um, it takes time. It takes preparation. It's niche. Not everybody understands that. You know, there's things like, you know, going back to the presentation that Carl did earlier, the service history, how's the previous owner driven the car, there's nuances in that. And the business is a little bit like that. And it's important to understand all those things before you can ascribe a value to that. So a well-looked after secondhand 50-year-old classic Corvette may be worth tens of thousands of dollars or rands, whereas, you know, one that's, you know, just about in a scrap heap might be worth nothing. So you know, when you're looking at a business and trying to value a business, it's a little bit like that. And it's super important if you're thinking about raising or selling, whether you're you know, a fintech startup, whether you're a creative agency, whether you're just a you know, normal bricks and mortar retail business, it is important to get an independent external assessment of what that value is. So part of the challenge is when you're in the business and it's your blood, sweat and tears and everything that you've been putting into that for the last 5, 10, 15 years, is you emotionally connected to that? And the analogy I like to use is, you know, if, you, if you're if trying to sell your, your grandmother's old house, which is, you know, falling apart at the seams, it might be in a good area, but for you, that house may have a lot of memories. It might be where you grew up, where you had family dinners, all of those things to you. So, you know, if, if you're trying to sell that, that house, it might be worth a lot to you sentimentally. But to you know, a property developer coming in and then wanting to buy that house, all he sees is a piece of land and a shell that's going to be knocked down, and they're going to build something on top of that. So it's important when you value your business to look at it not through those sort of emotional lenses, but to look through it through the lens of what a buyer might look at. So they're looking at saying, what is there? Um, it takes out some of that enthusiasm. I do want to kind of you know, disclaim that so that there may always Always be what we call a strategic buyer who's prepared to buy your business, you know, for a massive what we call multiple or massive price because there's strategic reasons for that. That's a one in a thousand or one in a million situation. For the most part, buyers look at this and they say, well, what, what do they see in the business? How is it performing? 
Um, what risk is associated with that profitability and performance now and into the future? And buyers and investors in a business want certainty. Yes, they want growth, but they want to know they're buying something. Is it going to be able to run reliably now and into the future? So those are some of the key things that we look at when we're valuing a business. So as I mentioned, you know, valuing a business is a bit of an art and it's a science. But from the art side, there are the sort of dynamics which are not, um, you know, it is the emotion. It's what's the potential. It's what all of the, what, what are those things. But there is also a science and there's sort of known tech, you know, known ways of valuing a business. So there are three common ways that a business will be valued. Um, and these are used by corporate financiers, they're used by bankers, they're used by professionals in valuing businesses. And the three most common ways to value a business are what we call the discounted cash flow methodology. We have what you call an earnings multiple methodology. And you have a net asset value methodology. Very briefly, what those are is a discounted cash flow looks and says, how much profit are you making now? How much profit are you going to make into the future? And how certain is that profit? And it looks at that and it says, take this year's profit plus future year's profit. The risk is accounted for by using what we call a discount factor. So the riskier a business, the higher that discount factor. So 100 rands profit in 10 years time is not worth the same as 100 rands profit today. And then we discount that back to arrive at a value. The second common way of valuing a business is what we call an earnings multiple approach. So that looks at businesses similar to yours. And it says, okay, you and agency are offering digital marketing expertise. You have turnover of you know, 10 million rand a year. Let's look at similar digital marketing agencies and see what did they sell for. And it applies what we call a multiple to your business. So that's a way that gets used. That methodology does have some challenges though. It doesn't look at your business. Just because you happen to be a six foot four male doesn't mean that you are Michael Jordan. Um, you know, if you put five, six foot four males next to each other, one might be a West Indian fast bowler, one might be a basketball player, one might just be a really tall guy who lives in Nurtuk. So the multiple approach does have, have its limitations, but it's a useful guide to understand where you sit. And then the last is what we call a net asset value. And, and this is typically what your accountant might say. What are your assets and what are your liabilities? So in other words, what, um, you know, what buildings do you have? What equipment? Um, what cash do you have in the bank? And from that, you would subtract what you owe to other people. So what creditors do you have? What liabilities do you have? So in doing evaluations, we look at all these factors. We look at the science. We look at the the art factors, we do look at the emotion. We look at things like, you know, is there owner dependence? Is there a succession plan in place? And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a little bit through the, the sort of Biswell methodology in terms of how we actually go about assessing the value of a business. So our approach has got about seven different sections that we look at. The first is getting to know you better or getting to know the business better. And there's a number of things that we look at over here. We look at things like the legal structure of your business. So are you a partnership? Are you a sole proprietor? Are you a company? These are important because the legal structure and the legalese guys will tell you this too, kind of tells you what liabilities and what risks are associated with your business. Generally speaking, you know, if you're an incorporated business or private company is better than selling a sole proprietor or partnership, your, the, the, the company's records are completely separate from the business owner when you have a legal structure. We look at the region, you know, is your business operating primarily in South Africa? Is it in the UK, is it in the US? And each region has different dynamics. All things else being equal, usually a business in the United States would be worth, worth more than a business in South Africa. It's doing the same thing in the same sort of turnover. And that's because the fundamentals there are different. They might have lower inflation. They might have a bigger market. We look at the age of the business. So, you know, a business that's been around for a while has got a track record. It's got credibility. As opposed to a business that's been around for two days, that might just be an idea on a piece of paper. Number of employees and the sector you're operating in. So some sectors are inherently more attractive than other sectors. You know, at the moment, sort of tech industry, 
you know, is a hot industry. People are looking at AI, they're looking at tech, as opposed to, I don't know, maybe you're a plumbing business. Um, plumbing businesses can make money, but they're not exciting from a growth perspective. So the sector you're in does matter when it comes to valuing your business. The second thing we look at is how do you make money? So it's important to understand the fundamentals. At the end of the day, unless a business is making money, as in cash profits, or has the ability to make that. And I'll touch on that just now, because a lot of startup businesses are in what we call the J-curve. They're still, they're still on the way to becoming profitable. That doesn't mean that your business doesn't have value. And I'll talk about that just now. But you have to be able to demonstrate that you can make money from the business. That's what an investor is buying. They're buying a future profit stream from your business. So we look at you know, are you selling goods or are you selling a service? So selling a service, you know, might be more dependent on people versus selling goods, you know, are those goods still relevant? You know, if you happen to be selling, you know, just before the advent of, you know, the motor car, if you were selling horses and carriages and a day later somebody invents the motor car, suddenly the type of goods that you're selling might not be that valuable. Um, we look at the margin. So how much profit, you know, are you pricing accordingly? And importantly, we look at customer dependency. So things like, do you have one big customer or do you have lots of smaller customers? So, you know, if you, all your revenue is from one big customer and that customer gets into trouble, suddenly your business is not worth as much. Whereas if you've got a diversified customer base, you know, one customer goes under or struggles, it doesn't impact your business. So those are the first two things we look at. Next, we look at things like your working capital. So how are you managing your things like your inventory? If you're selling stock, and I know most of you on this call are probably um, you know, tech or, or creative agencies, so that might not be relevant, but things like inventory matter. If you're selling goods and you've got you know, lots of inventory and half of that's been sitting in a back room gathering dust for the last five years, that inventory might be there, but it's not worth a lot. So how do you manage your inventory? How do you pay your debtors and your creditors? Are you reliable in terms of collecting from debtors? Do they pay you um, instantly or are you waiting two, three, four months to collect that debt? How are you paying your creditors? You know, the financial textbooks will say, well, delay paying your creditors as long as possible because mathematically that's the best way to, to optimize your working capital. But for a buyer looking in, if you're delaying paying your creditors for a long time, it might say that you don't have your house in order. Um, it might tell you about the integrity of management. Like, you know, why aren't you paying your creditors? So they would probe those sorts of things. And then have you got any excess cash in the business? So, you know, have you paid all the excess profits out as a dividend to owners or is it kept in the business? Now, that would also contribute to the business value. And then the fourth thing we look at is how do you spend your money? So, you know, expenses for staff and CEO, are you paying them a fair market salary? What are you paying for rental? You know, so uh, a lot of people have work from home businesses nowadays, but if somebody else is buying that, they might need to rent new offices. What are you spending on advertising and marketing? So in other words, what are you spending and how are you investing in future growth for your business? Um, I wanna to just touch on the sort of fair market salary for the owner. Often in businesses, we find that the founder and especially early stage businesses don't draw a salary or they draw a small salary. And they say, look, our business is profitable. But when you add back what that CEO should be earning, um, and if somebody buys you, they'd need to pay that salary, then suddenly the business isn't as profitable. So you need to make adjustments for things like a fair salary for the owner. Same applies to rental and property expenses. You know, you might own the building that you're operating in. Somebody buys the business, but not the building. And now they have to pay rental expenses. So we have to make adjustments to what we call normalize your expenditure. And then we look at your balance sheet. So who do you owe money to? So your business might be worth X, but if you owe millions to the bank, you first have to pay off those debts. So, you know, we need to factor any third-party debt you might have and any properties that the company might own that has a value attached to it. And then the last two things are probably the most important uh, in some ways is the phase of business. And the phase of business is, are you an early stage business? So are you a startup? Are you building towards profitability? Are you in a high growth phase? Or are you a mature business which is kind of in decline or ticking along steadily? 
Uh, what are the economies of scale that you have within your business? So, in other words, if you increase your revenue, do you need to increase your costs at the same rate to keep up? And importantly, the independence from the owner. I mean, this is probably one of the most crucial things in valuing the business. Can the business operate independently from the owner? So if the owner goes and leaves for three weeks, what happens? And that's a key question we need to ask ourselves. So when you're building a business for exit, any business is sometimes it's not a good thing if you're too involved in that business. And an external party looking in, it will be a red flag if the owner is too dependent. And that will negatively impact on the valuation. And then the last thing is the growth prospects. So a business which has got good growth prospects, it's working into a big market, it's growing rapidly, there's potential, has more value than a business which is operating in a declining market. And again, I'll use that analogy, um, you know, of a propeller plane versus a jet engine. The day after the jet engine was developed, the market for jet engines would grow rapidly. Somebody selling propeller planes would be going into a declining market. So we look at what the growth prospects are for the business, both in the short term and into the long term. And when a buyer looks at the business, they look and they say, well, how realistic is it that those growth prospects will be achieved? They look at the strength of management, they look at your past track record, they look at the size of the market, and they assess that. So when you're valuing a business, you need to take that into account. I just want to pause for a second because especially in fast growing businesses in startups, there's a lot of reliance placed on we're going to grow quickly. And that drives these sort of sometimes astronomical valuations. Now, often how that value is paid by a buyer is separated from the value. So if you say your business is growing at 30 or 40% a year, that might result in a very high on paper valuation that a potential investor might say to you, well, look, I'm prepared to pay you for that, but only when it materializes. So you'll hear terms like an earn out or deferred payments, and that's inextricably linked to the growth rate and your ability to achieve, achieve those. So that's something probably you know, can spend a whole webinar on, but it's something to bear in mind when you value a business. I want to just touch on a few, I guess, misconceptions and probably wrap up in the next three minutes is, so talking about startups, one of the challenges with startups is often they're based on ideas. So startups rely a lot more on the art. How big is the market? How much can we grow? And the financial metrics are not necessarily, you know, as mature. But having said that, essentially the principles stay the same, is how much cash profit can this business generate in the future? And investors will look at that, they'll look at the strength of management, they'll look at the size of the market, um, how robust your processes are, and they'll take a bet on that. The next one is promises versus track record. So as Aitan and Kyle mentioned earlier, buyers want certainty. They, they look at, you know, and, and that's why keeping records, being able to prove what you've done in the past is so important because a buyer will look at that and they say, well, look, what they're saying to us, and the promises they're making match up with what they've done in the past. So if you're saying you're going to grow at 30% a year for the next five years, and you've done that for the past five years, that carries a lot of weight. Whereas if you say I'm going to grow at 30% for the next five years, and you've only been growing at 5% for the last five years, then, you know, then buyers will look at that and they'll exercise a little caution around your future growth prospects. So keeping records and being able to demonstrate that is really, really important. Goodwill and brand is another one, you know, so it comes up often and we get clients saying to us, well, you know, I've got this brand, it must be worth something. At the end of the day, a brand is only worth something if it can generate future profits. There are exceptions. So the big household brands, you know, uh, name any of them, you know, Coca-Cola, for instance. Brands like that do have sort of intrinsic value, but for small businesses and the kinds of businesses we're talking about, you know, the brand doesn't have a value unless it can generate future profit. And then the last one, just looping back to this, is the extent of the profits is linked to the value of the business. So you know, just because you're making a profit doesn't necessarily make it valuable. You know, if you've sunk 10 or 20 million rand and you've got debt against that profit, that can actually make the overall business worth less. So 
you know, you've got to be able to demonstrate that you're generating profits and growing profits over a period of time. So in a nutshell, that is how, you know, we think about valuations, why they're important. Getting an independent valuation is often the first step in that journey to empowering yourself as a business owner, as a founder around how you can build your business. So yeah, that is it for now. I'm sure there's lots of questions. Um, just in closing, from a BizVal perspective, we've created a product called BizVal Express. We've got three core products. We've got BizVal Express, which is completely free. One of the things with this is you have to already be making a profit, but you can scan that QR code, and within 30 seconds, it will give you a good idea of, of what your business is worth. And then we have our other offerings. We've got BizVal Live, which you know, is a half an hour consultation. It's an online tool. We run through a couple of key questions with your business and some of the key drivers in terms of increasing your value. And that's suitable for most small businesses who want to dive a little bit deeper into what are the value drivers. And then we have our BizVal Concierge offering, which includes sort of two hours of consulting. We dig deep into the assumptions around your business. And that is really if you're serious about selling or you've got an offer on the table. So I want to thank the, the team from Legalese for hosting us today. Thanks to everyone for listening in. And if there's any questions, I'll hand it back to Aitan to facilitate that. Thanks so much, Graham. That was super interesting. Really appreciate that. And it's really amazing to, to see a bit of a deep dive into, into the different factors that go into it. And uh, I also really enjoyed how you separate in this the difference between um yeah the, the difference between the different types of companies and how many factors go into into this um graham and kyle do you guys want both want to switch on your cameras and what we can do is we can actually do some questions from here um i don't know if people if the people in the audience have questions what i suggest that you do is you can put it on the question answer platform or you can uh, uh put it in the chat and we'll bring them up um, and Carl and Graham can answer them. In the meantime, while people do that, I've got a question or two that I'm going to kick us off with. Um, first one, I want to just ask Graham. Graham, I, I, yeah, digging further, digging one step deeper into it, where do you see, so when I think of businesses' valuations, uh, there, there's factors, that there's unique aspects that make that business special. <clears throat> if I think of some of them, you, I mean, you mentioned brand, like a brand is a, hard thing to to grapple with but it's something which can add real valuation but there might be other ones for me it's like a, a, co a cornered resource as an example if you've got a, a a contract with a supplier and you're the only person that can bring that particular product into the country you've cornered resource another one might be something like a network or a scale economy right you're in a particular type of business that is one that's yeah. lent to scale where, where do you see those things adding to evaluation and does does your bit does Bisval, is Bisval able to take into account those magic factors those x factors that might make a business more valuable i think that's a great it's a great question and i think it talks to two core, core things it talks about size of potential earnings and the the quality of those potential earnings and um, when you've got an idea or a concept that nobody else has got, um, and also, yeah, exclusivity. So how many other people and competitors? So when we go through our processes, one of the things we look at, and we look at a few indicators around that, you know, so particularly when you go to sort of our concierge offerings, we will dive into that and understand, you know, who else is doing this in the market? Um, you know, is it something that's really unique? Um, the quality of the earnings, you know, so. Um, in other words, you know, is it just a fly-by-night idea or have you got a track record in some of these things? Those are really important. So when we go through our process, even in our live valuation process, we interrogate that. So we ask questions around who are your, you know, who are your customers? Okay. And what's the concentration around those customers? You know, we find like often niche businesses do really, really well because they don't have a lot of competitors. Um, you know, that's a key question we would ask is, is who are your competitors? Um, and, and, and that does add value, but equally, um, sometimes that can be a challenge. There might be a reason why you don't have any competitors. You, you might find that you're operating yeah. in a very declining market and the competitors have moved on to something else. So, so Aitan, yeah, I mean, a lot of those things are the more subtle and the more nuanced things. We've tried to build that into our questions. 
and our live valuation. But that's also why we've added, you know, we have a the conversation. Kind of with offering, with yeah. You. yeah, but even on the live, it's a conversation we have with you. When we when we launched, it was a purely a self-service offering. And one of the mm. things we realized is that human element and understanding some of these nuances are so, so, so important. Um, and you can only pick yeah. that up through conversation. So that's why every single one of the valuations we do, we do a quality review. Our team in the back end, even if you're doing a live valuation, will go and actually check some of these things. They'll look up the name of the company. They will do a quality review. And if we see something those things unique, matter. we'll reach out to you and, mm. and, and pick up on that. So, yeah, your business is a great example of that is, you know, there's not a lot of people doing, you know, law in the way that you're doing it. So it does make it unique and you need to, you need to factor that in. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was interesting to, to go through it. You know, when we when we did, when we kind of were starting to break apart some of the data, we, we saw that we have a very wide customer base, but uh, but no particular kind of anchor client, which for me, you know, from the day to day running of a business, it means you can't rely on that that kind of anchor revenue. But when it was interesting to, for, to be pointed out, when you look at the revenue, uh, when you look at the value of a, of a business, the fact that we have so many clients that are coming to us, um, meant that we're not we're not risked in, in, in with one so it was it was a really interesting process to to, to do it for our business um kyle, kyle a question for you at, at what point i mean you've probably i know that i mean <laughs> i know the work that you've done i know you've dealt with many mergers and acquisitions um at what point do you think someone should go see a lawyer in in, in this pro, in the process um is it when once they've got a term sheet is it before term sheet is it at the final stages that's my first question, and my second question is: is these factors that we're talking about, these the the the, the, the things that give your business value? How do, what do you do as a lawyer in order to bring that out to a client and protect those when you when you're doing a transaction? Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, so to answer the first part of the question, at what point do you start? It's actually you, you shouldn't you shouldn't be starting these things when you get a term sheet or when you you know when you're uh when you're receiving a, a potential offer of investment or anything like that ideally you should be starting these things very like from the very beginning mm. of your of your business uh, you know in an ideal world um the reality of that is that a lot of people don't do that up front um and they find out to their detriment that they that you know at the, at the point of of receiving an investment or a term sheet, they, they're, they're caught a little bit unawares and they have to then uh, spend a lot of money get, getting all their, all their, uh, their legal documentation and, and their, their legal structuring in line. So that is, uh, so, so my, my advice there is, is start, start early, start, um, you know, when you, when you start your company, get a shareholders agreement drawn, drawn up. Um, mm. When you start seeing a need for, for a piece of legal work, uh, the, that that's the point at which you should you should be addressing your your legal requirements. Have like for example, like I said, uh, start uh, when, when you have a, another shareholder, get a shareholders agreement together. When you when you start dealing with with multiple suppliers, um, get a supplier agreement or a service level agreement together. Um, make sure that your terms with your clients are are, are set forth cogently uh, from the very very beginning. Um, and then uh, to, uh, to answer your second question, what what factors do I do I sort of look at? Um, I try to take a, a, a sort of holistic approach. Um, I look at I look at obviously you know all the relevant factors and all of the um, uh, the applicable aspects of, of a person's business that uh, uh, in providing the advice that I do. And and uh, when when you look at that sort of stuff, it, it sort of sketches a picture of of the person's company and and their their uh, what what we sort of consider at legally is to be like a, a like a, a a fully legally compliant company uh, or, or or a company that that is uh, that is legally ripe for investment yeah so i suppose that that process of making sure that you that you're ready for an exit doesn't start when you're starting to an exit right it starts from how you build your business and if you're focusing on the stuff that makes your business ripe for investment such as making sure that your clients are contracted that your staff are you know have uh, uh, a retention strategy with your staff that you've you know built that you've got a share with you and that sort of stuff starts starts way earlier so that's really interesting yeah and, um, and those kind those kinds of things as well uh can, can make your company more 
attractive to investors as opposed to as opposed to like doing it at 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 a, at a later stage. For sure, awesome. I, I think okay, cool. Yeah, look, you know, for sure. Uh, it's common known fact, but there was some research done um, in the US and in SA that eighty five percent of businesses don't sell. Okay. Only 15% of businesses will sell at a point in time. Um, and to that point is, you know, it's not saying that, that 85% don't get offers, but they're not sellable. Um, you know, so just to reinforce that point, we see in practice, even a business that is potentially getting ready for sale, it's, it's anywhere from a six month to a two year process. Um, and mm. the sooner you start, the better, you know, so um, there's things like we offer a program called Bootcamp where we'll actually assess the business's readiness for sale, sale readiness. So we'll go through, do you have a shareholder agreement? Do you have dependence uh, on the owner or not? Um, and there's a checklist of things. And, and the output of that is effectively what they call in deal terms a data room. And the data room is nothing more than a well-organized filing cabinet with all yeah. your legal documents, all your financial documents, all of those things planned. And if you've got that ready, you know, you as a business yeah, owner well. are empowered. You know, you're not, you're not, you, you, you can drive the discussion and the agenda. If you don't have that, your company might be making the same profit as a business that does have that. But from a, the, the buyer is going to knock your price down because he's going to look at you and say, yeah, but you don't have this and you don't have that. So if your house is in order, you're empowered as an owner, you know what those things are. It enables you to achieve the real value of your business. If you don't have it, it's a reason for a buyer to knock your selling price down. And that's one of the main reasons why it's so important to have these things in place. 100%. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that I think about it, the, the, the aspects of a business which make a business sellable are also the aspects of a business which make it a good business, right? So having uh, codified aspects of your business, make it not reliant on one specific key man or key person, make the, the aspects that, you know, varying your, your client base, um, understand, you know, having a protected brand. These are things which are good for exits, but they're also good for, for good business practices. Mm. Um, fantastic. Cool. We run into the end. I don't see any questions, but, um, I think that that is fine. It's been a great discussion. We just said about it out of time. Graham, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your insight. If anyone wants to get a hold of Bizval, I'm pretty sure you can do it on the website or through the socials. I, uh, I don't find you a hard man to get hold of. Um, and if uh, anyone wants to get hold of us at Legalese and chat about preparing your company for exit or doing that, that legal gap analysis, um, sounds like a similar thing to what Bizval do with, um, with uh, 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 that, that, that product that you mentioned. Um, yeah, we're all here to assist. And uh, so hopefully we can... We can make the people in the room be not part of the 15% of companies that don't sell, but part of the 85. And that's, uh, well, not part of the 85 that don't sell, but part of the 15 that do. <laughs> um, cool. Thanks so much, gents. Thanks for joining us. And thank you to everyone too, for joining us today. We do a webinar like this once a month. We're always open for new topics. We try and make them something that's interesting for small, medium-sized business owners in the tech and creative space. So feel free to shoot us a topic, or if you can get involved in one, let us know. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.